Good evening and a warm welcome to all of you here this evening. Thank you so much for being here uh, for this lecture. This one is the ninth in a great tradition, what is becoming a very good tradition here at Elmhurst College. Uh, my name is Kevin O'Donnell, as Dr. Curitan told you. Uh, I'm the director of campus ministry for the Catholic Diocese of Joliet, and as such, I serve here on campus at Elmhurst as the Catholic co-chaplain. And I'm very appreciative to Elmhurst College for all that it does as an institution to encourage dialogue and learning uh, amongst its students and faculty and staff around great issues, uh, significant issues that affect our world. This Bernadin lecture is just one example of many things that the college does to encourage that dialogue and learning. Before I introduce Sister Helen, a few words of thanks, though, to a lot of people who have helped make this uh, lecture happen. Uh, many different people, but some key people, some very important people who uh, follow through on lots of details. Ms. Alexis Orange, Chaplain Matheny, uh, the members of the Bernadine team, faculty who have promoted this uh, lecture this evening uh, to their students and even encouraged it through their syllabus and whatnot, um, to donors and to a number of great student leaders here at the college who've done a lot of work to make this happen. Certainly some of them serving tonight as ushers, Spiritual Life Council, and uh, Black Student Union especially this evening. Uh, and probably in a special way, all these people who are willing to sit for, what is it, four hours? <laughs> <laughs> there has been much excitement over these last few years, and certainly over these last few days as this evening has gotten much closer. It's even a little bit more remarkable though that Sister Helen is here this evening because home base for her is New Orleans and office was uh, devastated and uh, Sister Helen and her assistant really just began kind of a blind search, Sister Helen said today, by dialing 411 in the cities that they thought they were supposed to be speaking in and trying to put the schedule back together that way. So very grateful that Sister Helen is here despite all that uh, has happened in her home. Sister, uh, I'm sure that that too, though, Sister Helen credits the support of her community of sisters, the Sisters of St. Joseph of, of Madai. I also want to point out that after the lecture, we have microphones here. We didn't have wirelesses, so we'll have to, there will be time for questions and answers. You'll have to be brave enough not only to just raise your hand, and, but you'll have to come forward. So start thinking about that now. Please, uh, please do share your questions. Here at the front of the chapel also we have a candle burning this evening and as fate would have it, uh, there was a woman executed this evening in Texas at about 6.15, uh, the night that we have Sister Helen here to share. And I asked Sister Helen when I picked her up from the airport today if she knew Francis Newton and she just hung her head and said, I know Francis. So uh, it's particularly poignant this evening uh, that Texas has executed somebody just as we're about to listen to Sister Helen talk about that journey in her life. So this candle burns for Francis Newton, who there was evidently some serious question about her guilt, so an innocent woman may have been put to death. But I'm here to say, I, I say too, that this, this candle is here to remind us that this is not just an academic or a legal discussion that we're about to hear this evening. This is very much a spiritual journey. So to remind us to be open to that this evening. Sister Helen has lived and worked in Louisiana all of her life, and she began this particular part of her life's journey working in the capital justice, uh, capital punishment, uh, working with the capital punishment issue uh, almost 20 years ago. She had moved into the St. Thomas, one of the housing projects in St. Thomas in Louisiana, and uh, began working with poor inner city residents there. She was soon invited to begin corresponding by letter with a death row inmate, and that's where it all began. Many of you no doubt that Sister Helen's first book, Dead Man Walking, became a film, and then was adapted to a stage play as well recently, and I think earlier than the stage play, it was also an opera. Sister Helen continues her work counseling death row inmates and has accompanied six men to their executions on death row as spiritual advisor and witness. This past December, Sister's much-anticipated book, The Death of Innocence, was released, and in it she shares the stories of two men who were likely innocent of the crimes for which they were ultimately executed, among other things that she shares in the book. 
later this evening we will ask for a free will offering for anybody who would be interested. So moved to benefit Sister Helen's moratorium campaign, an organization she founded a few years ago. She served on the board of the National Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty, has been involved with Amnesty International and an organization called Hands Off Cain. Sister has received multiple awards, honorary degrees, and has been a featured guest on multiple news shows and television programs for her tireless work in getting the story out about the need to abolish the death penalty. In The Death of Innocence, Sister writes, after the account of the ex ex execution of Dobie Gillis Williams, she says, yes, I'm going to miss him, yes. I'm witness to it, and my mission is to keep getting on planes and crisscrossing this country, to talk in cities and towns to awaken people's souls about the need to abolish the death penalty. That is no doubt powerful language to speak of awakening somebody's soul. And I'm not one who's often starstruck, but I do say this evening that I am a little bit. Uh, to have this woman here with us tonight is a big deal. I've heard Sister Helen speak many times before, and if you have, then you know that indeed she is a remarkable woman and has a remarkable story. Again, thank you all for being here this evening, and I invite you that her soul may speak to yours this evening, that you lend your attention to Sister Helen Prejean. We're here to talk about life and death. We're here to talk about our country, the social fabric that holds us together, the images that came out of the Superdome in New Orleans and the Montreal Convention Center where people were just wandering aimlessly through waist-high water, without food, without water, with no plan, no buses, is a signal, it's an emblem of the neglect that has been going on in our cities for a long time. People have been drowning in, Louise, in New Orleans for a long time. I didn't know people were drowning because I was in a nice boat for a long time in my religious life before I awakened to a deeper call in the message of Jesus to be on the side of the poor and struggling ones. And I'm a storyteller. I know the death penalty is an issue that most people struggle with. And when I have faced and looked into the victims, the families, the parents of victims that have been killed, and see the loss on their faces and the desolate look that they can never have their child back, I have felt that same outrage in me for those who violated the lives of the innocent. But we want to navigate morally we want to feel the outrage for those who have been killed and were innocent. But we also want to look critically at how our society deals with violence and what our own response should be. Let me just say a little bit here about uh, the film of Dead Man Walking before I get into the inner parts of my own journey. Uh, Goethe. Uh, a playwright, dramatist, writer, said a long time ago, if we are committed to a cause, and our cause is just, and we're unswerving in that commitment, providence begins to work for us, and resources make their way to us. And I have to tell you that my experience has been that. I'm going to tell you the story of how the commitment, and how the fire, how, how the, the passion was forged in my soul. But when Susan Sarandon called me, when after the book Dead Man Walking had come out, it had been out about a year, and said that she was reading the book, she was in Memphis, she was filming the client, one of Grisham's stories, and she had to come to New Orleans for a couple of days of filming and said she'd love to meet me and we could have supper together. I said, great. I had heard about Susan Sarandon through Amnesty International, but I didn't know what she looked like, so I went and rented Thelma and Louise. To, <laughs> I didn't want to be the only one in the restaurant. She came in. I don't know who she is, you know. And um, <clears throat> got her mixed up with Gina Davis through the whole Bloomin' movie. I'm looking at Gina Davis, 
who's, you know, that ditzy one that keeps doing all those stupid things. And, and, kept, and the sisters, we were looking at it together. Everybody was thrown off. And they said, she's going to be you? And I went. <laughs> and so when Susan walked in this restaurant, this good little Cajun restaurant, the Bon Ton, I said, thank you, Jesus. She's Louise. I was so relieved. <laughs> Susan and I sit at this table, and we start talking. Just two women sit together at a table in a restaurant talking. And she was the one who knew we needed a film in this country to help mainstream America get underneath the surface of the death penalty. Because you ask, I mean, when I started doing this in 84, everybody in their cat thought the death penalty was a great idea. Oh, yeah, we got to keep ourselves safe. These people, they're going to get out and they're going to murder again. I read something in Parade magazine or whatever. We get these stories of some people who get out and kill again. So we got to execute people. It's the only way we can be safe. But that's not the deepest reflection. And see, Susan, she's, she says, Tim, Tim Robbins is the one to do this. So, of course, I got to go rent a movie, see what he looks like, too. <clears throat> so I rented Bull Durham. That's where they met each other, you know. And, uh, and, um, and she couldn't get him to read the book because he, was, he had a lot of projects going on. She'd periodically call me, give me a little report. I know if I can get him to read the book. I know he'll want to do the film. Nine months went by, and one night, she and Tim are walking down the streets of New York, and she took him by the arm, and she burst into tears, and she said, Tim, if we are not going to do the film of Dead Man Walking, we need to turn it over to somebody who will, because we have got to deepen the reflection in this country about the death penalty. So he goes, okay, Susan. She doesn't cry that often. And uh, he read the book. And the film. And I thought Tim Robbins, screenwriter, director, Susan Sarandon, and then they got this guy, Sean Penn, had to go rent a film on him too. <clears throat> I thought every Hollywood studio was gonna jump at the chance to do this film, you know? And it would get to the second highest level of decision making, and they'd call Tim Robbins and say, Tim, I mean look, Tim. It's a downer, okay? The guy's guilty, he's gonna be executed, and then like he got a nun with the death row inmate. We got no romantic element in the, in the movie. <laughs> now you let us spice it up a little bit with the nun and the death row inmate, maybe we could have something here. We never could have a box office success. <laughs> and they all turned it down. They turned it down, and Polygram Film International had only done one successful movie, Four Weddings and a Funeral, because they did albums. They picked it up. They said, we'll do it. Small budget, I thought it was a lot of money, but they say 12 million isn't a very big budget for a film. <laughs> <clears throat> and don't you know, Tim got in there, boy, and we collaborated so closely. Every scene, you know, every, what was my family like? What was it like for me? What, I mean, we just were just collaborative in the whole effort. And that's just a little clue for me. I'm saying this to the students here tonight. You know somebody's really great when they collaborate. When people hold their cards close to their chest and they're conscious of their little arena and their little turf, they insecure. Tim Robbins, sitting down together, Helen, what was it like? He's reading books. I gave him this book, Jesus Before Christianity, to read. He read it. And, uh, and so then when he was editing it, I said, uh, Tim, how are we going to get people to come see our film? And he said, well, we're banking on Academy Award uh, nominations, maybe picking up an Academy Award or two. And I'm going, Tim, that's a long shot. He said, Helen, the whole movie is a long shot. <laughs> and on March 25th, 1996, we were nominated for four uh, Academy Awards and Bruce Springsteen before 1.3 billion people got to sing his little dead man walking song, went out to the whole world. Sean was nominated, Tim was nominated, and Susan received the Academy Award. She'd been nominated four other times, and the movie was given over to the world. I was in Japan like a month, six weeks later, and the taxi cab driver was going, dead man walking. And it, <laughs> it just went out. And when you're writing a book, it's very quiet, 
Everybody else is going off to work. I remember reading about a writer who, when his wife would come home, he'd get up and vacuum, look like he's doing something. Because sometimes when you write and you feel like you're not doing anything, you know, and writing's hard. It has its own. And there was many a day when I sat there when I was writing Dead Man Walking, just wondering. But I knew this. I needed to be truthful and I needed to be honest. And to, because I also knew that people were never going to get close to this thing that I'd been drawn in as a witness. Now, let me tell you how it happened. The first thing was to go and live among poor and struggling people in New Orleans. That took some waking up. I didn't always get that the gospel of Jesus was about social justice. I lived out of the thing of, well, I'm charitable to people. I'm kind to people. And, uh, and that, you know, one day we'd all go to heaven, just lead a good life here. And people are poor, well, that's God's will for you. You suffer, you be a good poor person. Uh, and then you get to go to heaven. Your crown's going to be even bigger if you suffer. But don't change things. Don't question the social order. And when you begin, when I studied scripture for a number of years, and you get to those Hebrew prophets, you get to Amos and Isaiah and Jeremiah, they were questioning the social order. And, but I was resisting this thing of that nuns ought to be doing social justice because I was a teacher and I did retreats. And I go, social justice? I said, we nuns, we're not social workers. Uh, excuse me, Betty, a social worker, I know you're sitting in here tonight. But I didn't know how to pick it up. I didn't know how you go about changing society. And, and so then we had a conference, and you never know when a moment's going to come where suddenly things fall into place and you know you're going to be different. And I went to this conference, this, this sister was talking, Sister Maria Augusta Neal, and I can tell you the line that changed my life. I'm here before you tonight on that trajectory. She said, Jesus preached good news to the poor. And I thought I knew the net, what she was going to say next about how every hair of their head was numbered and a loving, compassionate, heavenly father, no sparrow drops to the ground without your heavenly father knowing it. And she said, the good news Jesus preached to the poor Integral to it was that they would be poor no longer. And something happened to me. They would be poor no longer. And then I began to think of the Gospels. Because there's a way we can domesticate Jesus. We can make him this very comfortable little middle class guy. You know where we get our personal salvation. Be close to God. And we never look at the suffering of the world. And Jesus is so enmeshed when you look at it. I was hungry he gave me to eat. He was crucified, and you know, we walk into places, and that's a symbol of execution. We wear symbols of execution around our necks. It has become the symbol of Christianity. Jesus was crucified not because he preached a dreamy kind of, everybody's loved by God, whip out your guitars, everybody sing love one another right now, and everybody go home. They never would have crucified Jesus for that. He inaugurated a new kind of community that was so radical where people were treated with dignity and respect. No one was in need. They, they shared everything in common. People from different tribes, they would say this about the first followers of Jesus, how they have people with different races and tribes. They call one another brother and sister. You know, they share all... He inaugurated that community. He held up a child. They weren't even considered persons. They were just little workers in the field and holds up a child and says, whoever receives a child receives me. Dignity to women, talking to women, women part of the disciples, part of the community. And that's why they killed him. But I'm sitting there just like you sitting here tonight, and my body didn't move, but boy, I got it. I said, I don't even know any poor people. And I had lived in New Orleans for 20 years. But I lived out on the lakefront. You ever notice how we can live in little bubbles? We can live like a little train goes around a Christmas tree. You know, you got one little track and you, with a lot of people just like you, go to church with people like you. And that we need terribly in this country to cross over into the sections of our cities where people are drowning all the time and we need to question that social fabric that's allowing that to happen all of this opens up for me and I, I moved in among the people of St. Thomas and then my real education began because I was a white woman of privilege growing up in the south we had African Americans for our servants when I was a young girl Went to a private school, everything segregated, never questioned it. 
And now I'm in St. Thomas Housing Development and learning from people, learning from grandmothers coming in. Sister, I want to learn to read because I want to be able to read my Bible. Kids coming into our adult learning center who had gotten to the 11th grade in public school and they couldn't read a third grade reader. Gunshots. Every time, gunshots. Mama's running out. Where's my child? They got no choice about where they could live. They can't afford rent in another part of the city. All this had been going on, and it could have been in India. It's so far removed was I from this. And it was while I was in St. Thomas that one day, coming out of the Adult Learning Center, a friend came out of the prison coalition office and just said, it was casual. We're both walking down St. Andrew Street like two little ants. We bump into each other. It's Chava Colon. He has a clipboard, got a project going on. They always had projects going on in the prison coalition office because Louisiana incarcerates people more than any other state in this country. We have the highest incarceration rate. That's what we do with poor people who fail. We throw them into prison. It's a, grow, it's a growth industry. And he bumps into me that day, and he had, hey, Sister Helen, you want to write somebody on death row? I said, sure. I could write some letters. Look how sneaky God is. <laughs> it was 1982, and we hadn't executed anybody in Louisiana in over 20 years. Neither had you. The whole country was on official moratorium, just not practicing the death penalty. And so he gives me the guy's name. I think I'm only going to be writing letters. Patrick Saunier, and then his prison number, and then an address which gave me pause, death row. I thought, oh my, what is it like to, when your address is death row? It's got to be a downer just to read your mail. <laughs> and I write the man, and you know what the problem was? He wrote back, and we had an encounter between two human beings across all kind of lines and divisions. I didn't have any big plans. I'm not going to go and take on the death penalty. I never dreamed they were going to kill this guy. And we began to write. And then out of that, it all flowered. And when the Spirit of God works inside of us, it has a peaceful, organic feel to it. It's not like snapping and jumping and jerking around. It just flowers gradually. And so as I wrote, and he wrote, and I realized he had no one to visit him, I was reading and meditating with Matthew 25. How many times had I meditated on this passage in, this, in the scriptures? I was hungry, you gave me to eat. I was in prison, and you came to me. Boing, yong, 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 yong. You know when it hits you, because you know we all are little spin doctors with these scriptures. We're very familiar with them. Oh, yeah, I was hungry, you gave me to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. I was in prison, he came to me, and you know, the little spin is, well, some people are called to that ministry. I myself am not personally called to that. <laughs> or you can say, uh, oh, well, in different ways we put, you know, in prison, psychological imprisonment. You can, doesn't mean like prison, it means like alcohol or psychological imprisonment or whatever. And I see the words and I know what they mean, and I write to him and just say, I will come and visit you. I'm not changing my ministry, not changing everything I'm doing. I just go and I begin to visit with him. Well, he's so excited. I get this letter back in the mail. Here's Sneaky Part of God, part two, because he says, well, look, I'm a Catholic. You're a nun. Will you be my spiritual advisor? I'm filling in, yeah, spiritual advisor. Yeah. I don't have a clue that two and a half years later, they are going to kill him in the electric chair in the death house and as spiritual advisor. At 6 in the evening, the execution's going to happen at midnight. And at 6 in the evening, everyone is going to leave the death house except the spiritual advisor, who's going to be me. And that I will walk with him. And that I will accompany him to his death and tell him to look at my face when they do this. And the way grace works in us is not ahead of time. If anything I'm learning, it's you can't anticipate grace. You follow the path. In Latin America, they say the path is made by walking, like we have a little bitty pen light, and that's what happened. If I knew what was waiting for me at the end of the road, I do not think I could have said yes to going to be with this man. But it all unfolded, and it was his human need, his loneliness, his being condemned to death. I, now, I don't know much about the death penalty. I'm learning about all the social issues when I moved into St. Thomas. There was a saying, I already knew this. 
There was a saying in the neighborhood, capital punishment means dim it out to capital, get the punishment. And boy, that sure has proved to be true. In the almost 1,000 human beings, we have lethally injected or electrocuted or gassed to death or hung or shot. Virtually all of them are poor. So when I looked in that Superdome and saw the left behind, saw them trying to fend for themselves, you know who I thought of. So I go visit this man, Patrick Sonier, and I'm scared because I'd never been in a prison. You know how you do something, you go, oh, I am now going to visit this man in prison. Then when I got there, I mean, it was scary at the prison. I'd never been in a prison before. And you know, nuns in New Orleans, we get a lot of respect because half the city in their cat is Catholic. Everybody's been to a Catholic school. Sister, how you doing? We can ride the buses free in New Orleans. <laughs> <clears throat> but the prison? And I see this big green sign, by stepping on prison property, you subject yourself to this body search, body cavities. I stopped reading the sign. I went, oh my goodness, man, I am out of my native land. I am in the belly of the beast. It was scary, because I wasn't in charge. It was just like, and they bring you through these gates, locking them behind you, and then we'll go get your man. And then they lock me in the room. And then I start being nervous about him because I'm pacing up and down, I'm holding on to my cross, and I'm thinking, you know, anybody can write a nice letter. He writes very nice letters. He's always asked me, but I never have, I never been with anybody for two hours who was a murderer before. I mean, we're gonna be talking to him. I'm not gonna be able to have a normal conversation with this man. And then the guards brought him in. And this is what shocked me. I looked through the heavy mesh screen. He was, he was confined in a little cubicle. I was on the other side was how human his face was. I couldn't believe he looked like a human being. Well, what did I think, some monster, what? But see, when we don't see people, and we imagine. And he said, sister, you came. You drove all that way to see me, thank you. And the two hours flew by, and we visited. Found out he had a brother, Eddie, serving a life sentence at Angola, our prison. I went, how did that work? It's a murder, don't know the crime yet. And one brother gets death and one brother gets life. <clears throat> now I know a lot more about how the legal system works. And I know this, that if there are two co-defendants in a murder and one is willing to give evidence against the other one, they receive a reduced sentence for doing that. And what they want to do when they go to trial is get somebody. So right away justice is compromised in this. Trials are supposed to be the time where truth-telling happens and judgments are made. And I'm going to begin to discover that far from the truth being told, especially in the second book, The Death of Innocence, every court in the land found those two people guilty and allowed them to be executed. And you, when you read the book, you will be the first full jury they ever had who knows all the facts that the jury never heard because defense was so poor and so inadequately funding, funded that they couldn't get the evidence in. Well, now with Pat and Eddie, the first question was that. But now I'm not a lawyer. My daddy was a lawyer, but boy, am I going to begin to descend into the law. You learn the law when it impacts on people that you care about. That's when you begin to learn the law, just like you learn about diseases in medicine when somebody, you know, has cancer or whatever. And that's what was going to happen to me. I went over to the prison coalition office after I began to visit. I figured while I was making the trip to see Pat, I'd see Eddie too. Why well, make the long trip and not just visit with both the brothers? So I'm getting to know them, getting to know them as human beings and... I know they've done something. I know they've done something really terrible. I've done, I know they've done the worst thing in the world. But you're looking in their eyes, it was just a strong, strong sense that these people are worth more than the worst thing they've done in their life. It's the human dignity in all of us. It would be the subject of a dialogue with Pope John Paul II. I said, Your Holiness, does the Catholic Church only uphold the dignity of innocent people? What about guilty people? And when I'm walking with people to execution and they say to me, Sister, please pray that God holds up my legs, there is no dignity in this death. Part of the dialogue there. And that I'll maybe say a little bit about more later. Go over to the prison coalition office. I knew there'd been a crime. I didn't want to be naive. And I said, could I have some background on the Sonia case? And they say, sure. And they pull out all these folders. And I remember it was a, 
October afternoon and the sun was slanting through on the table. And they were leaving the office. They said, look, sister, just take any, all the time you want. But when you leave, just pull the door. So I was alone. And I opened up this folder and looked down into the faces of two beautiful teenage kids. They were in their prom outfits. They were on the front page of the Daily Iberian, a little town in Acadiana where the murders happened. And a big, bold headline, Teenagers Found Murdered. And then with horror, to read the details, the two men I'm visiting about how Patrick and Eddie Sonier on the night of November 4th, 1977, these two kids had gone to a football game on a Friday night. And this was out, you know, they have sugar cane, a lot of sugar cane fields in Acadiana. And the kids said there was a lover's lane where they had gone to park. And when they were found murdered, five other teenage couples came forward to say, these brothers did the same to us. Now, no one had been killed, but a number of the young girls had been raped. And I'm reading this, and I'm going, first thing I felt was guilt. Like, I'm, like, consorting with the people who kill these kids. And then how the kids were found lying face down, bullet holes in the backs of their heads. And then I'm thinking of the faces of the men I'm talking to, that they did this. And I just go, what am I doing here? What, how did this happen? And then I think of the parents. This is every parent's worst nightmare. Your kid goes out on a Friday night and they don't come home. And I'm thinking, I ought to reach out to the parents. But I was scared. I was saying, I'm the spiritual advisor to the one who killed their kids. They're not going to want to see me. Hang on, I was just going to make them angry or just increase their pain. And you know, when I wrote the first draft of Dead Man Walking, I played that down. I, that I was confused. I'd never done this before. I didn't say much about why I didn't reach out to the victim's family. And my good Jewish editor, Jason Epstein, he's looking at this and he's going, well, Helen, it was cowardice, wasn't it? <laughs> I mean, you were scared, weren't you? And I went, yeah. Yeah, he said, look, when you write your book, don't just take people with you on the peaks of the waves when you do things right. Take them with you when you do things wrong. Well, boy, was this big. I didn't do anything to reach out to these parents who had lost their children. I'm with Patrick Sonier, I'm with Eddie, and then everything is ratcheting up for the execution. I'm in the newspaper, I'm on TV, and I meet them at the pardon board. At the pardon board is the last dramatic moment where when you go into the room, you actually sign the book of which side you're on. You remember the Roman amphitheaters? Thumb up, you want a person to live. Thumb down, you want a person to die. Well, at pardon board hearings, you actually sign the book. Are you on the side of the state that wants to kill the person? Or are you on the side of the defendant and you want to ask for clemency? And I meet them at the worst possible time. It couldn't be more polarized. By then, they just want to have it over with. And when do they meet me? Coming to the pardon board to speak for clemency to the one who killed their, their child. And Eddie had gotten a life sentence. That's another story. You can read the details of it in the, in the book. But I just embodied for them somebody who didn't care about them and was standing up for the murder and trying to give him spiritual consolation before he dies, which their kids didn't have. So when I did meet them, we were walking outside and the, while the pardon board was voting, and I met the two parents, the two sets of parents. Loretta Bork had been killed. She was 18. David LeBlanc had been killed. He was 17. And we were walking outside the building and the Bork family came up first. And they were just so angry. They said nothing, they averted their eyes, and they walked past me in stony silence, which I understood, because they were angry and they had a right to be angry. Right behind them was the LeBlanc family. Their son David had been killed. Lloyd and Eula LeBlanc, I expect the same from them. I'm bracing myself for it. And up they walk, and Lloyd LeBlanc says, Sister, I'm Lloyd LeBlanc. This is my wife, Eula. That's our son, David, that was killed. Very Cajun, very. And he said, uh, Where have you been? Where have you been? We have not had anybody to talk to, and you can't believe the pressure on us with this death penalty thing. And I'm shocked, because 10 minutes earlier, when the pardon board asked the victim's family to speak, what did they desire? 
Lloyd LeBlanc had been the one to stand up for both families and say, we desire the execution to proceed. We desire justice to be done. And now 10 minutes later, he's looking in my eyes and he's saying, sister, where have you been? Later, I found out from him the reason he did that was that Mr. Bork was so emotional and so upset. He said, Lloyd, you gotta talk for us because I could blow it. I could get up there and I'll be too emotional. Maybe it'll work against us. You gotta stand up. You gotta say that we want this execution. And so he had done it. But now he's looking at me and saying, where have you been? And I just had to just say, Mr. Boy, I am so sorry. I didn't think that you'd wanna see me. I, and he said, and he's real friendly, real, Cajun's are very direct, you know, and he just went, well, may sister, but sister, may you don't know what I think till you come over, we're gonna have a cup of coffee, I'm gonna tell you what I think. And I wanna say, but you don't know what a coward I am. He was the first victim's family I met who reached out his hand to me and started bringing me down along the road of what a victim's family goes through. He chose the road of healing. He was Christian deeply Christian, like following what Jesus said. And I learned that as I'd go to pray with him in the chapel. If you notice in Dead Man Walking, the film ends with my praying with Earl de la Croix. Name means cross, a victim's family. It ends in prayer, that film. When we were filming, I was saying to Tim, Tim, you think we can end a movie with prayer? Because it doesn't look like you're doing anything. I mean, you know. And he goes, you're the nun, and you asking me if we can end a movie in prayer. <laughs> I said, well, like, he said, watch. Watch what happens in this. Well, Lloyd de Blanc, the prayer with Lloyd de Blanc was what, where my soul really got shaped because I realized as he prayed that he was praying for everyone. And gradually his story came out to me as he began to trust me more about how when the sheriff's deputy came for him to bring him to the morgue to identify his son. He said, and he's our only son. Our family name died with him. He said, and they brought, pulled David's body out on that cold tray, and he looked into the face of his son. He said, I said the prayer I had learned from my mom and daddy when I was a little boy, and at Eucharist every Sunday, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And when he comes to the words, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. He said, sister, I said the words. I didn't feel the words, but I knew what Jesus wanted me to do. Then he gave me the best insight into forgiveness of, of anybody. He said, you know, people think forgiveness is weak like you condoning what they did. Condoning. He said, my wife almost lost her mind. She cried for three years. We had to move our house close to where David's grave so she could visit every day. Condone. I could never condone what they did. But he said, I'm a loving man. I'm a kind man. And he said, they killed my boy, but I'm not going to let them kill me. And if I let that anger and bitterness be in me, they're going to kill me too. And Jesus said to forgive, so I'm going to do what Jesus said to do. And that was Lloyd LeBlanc. And he stands among us today, as do many other people in this country, murder victims, families for human rights. Jennifer Bishop is sitting in here with us tonight with the Illinois Coalition. Many people, like Jennifer and others, have lost a loved one to violence, and they stand before us as the witnesses to say, to have the state imitate the killing and tell us we can go sit in the front row and watch is not going to heal us. And it's time for us in this country to take a look at what we're saying. We're actually saying in the political rhetoric, you hear politicians, we're going to go for the death penalty because that's how we're going to show how much we honor these victims who lost their lives to violence. Sometimes I've heard DAs making their arguments in trial, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we so respect life that we're gonna ask for the death of this person who has killed this person so that we can show that killing is wrong. And you see, when we're separated from them, and you're not, no, I know what happened with Frances tonight when she was brought over to the Walls unit two days ago. 
I know the room and the cell that they had are sitting in as they're waiting, is approaching this whole protocol of death. I know that at 4.30, her spiritual advisor could go see her for the last time and then leave because the generic chaplain takes over. Texas does it far worse than Louisiana, at least that your own spiritual advisor can be with you, who knows you and can accompany you. They don't even do that. But we're so removed. Who knows this? Who sees this? And of course we're outraged when we hear about the innocent death of people, people who are innocent. Of course we're outraged. But what do we do with the outrage? And I begin to get drawn into it. I begin to go to murder victim support groups, and I begin to realize they're all alone too. What real help is given to murder victims' families? Sometimes people lose their jobs. They need counseling. They need help. Marriages break apart. Parents that lose their kids, either to disease or violence, over 70% of them divorce. Whatever fault lines are in the marriage, the stress and the grief breaks it apart. They need all kinds of help, healing help. And imagine to say, now you wait now, 10, 15 years from now, we're going to call you. You come sit. You get to watch while we, euphemism, do justice for your dead child. We call it justice. And the state, I call it like moral bankruptcy or an act of despair. The only thing we know to do to show how we respect life is to imitate the killing, to kill the killers, to try to teach our children that killing's wrong. How can we look at this thing, look at it for what it is, and deal with our own feelings, our own feelings of outrage, but also our feelings of justice? And then you start learning information about this. When you hear people say, oh, we're doing it for the victim's family, you begin to find out we're talking about a very select group of victim's families. Roughly 14,000 homicides in this country every year, less than 2% of all the people who kill other people are chosen for death. Can you guess who they are? The first qualifier is, did you kill a white person or not? That's been a consistent pattern of the thousand people that we have executed. And, and consistently, over 80%, eight out of every 10, are sitting on death row because they kill white people. And people of color in this country are over 50% of the homicide victims. Why is it that the death penalty is so seldom sought for a person of color? Is it possible that we value some of our citizens' lives, we identify with some of our citizens' lives more than with others? How did it happen that 150,000 people without cars were not included in the evacuation plan for New Orleans? That was just a symbol of what's been going on for a long time. And so you want to look at the death penalty, it becomes like a prism that helps us understand a lot of things that's going on in our society. You can't get race out of it. You look at death row and say, oh, it looks like 50-50 there. You got whites and blacks. Yeah, that's even, that's equal. Until you look at the race of the victim who was killed. Not every death causes outrage. Not every death in this country causes prosecutors to say, we're going to seek the ultimate punishment. Some victims, all life, let me just say this, all human life should be respected. No one should be violated. But then it, the pattern by now is so clear. Who does the most executing of the 10 southern slaves that had slaves the longest? When white people are killed, you really up notch up the possibility of getting the death penalty. Right around the time when an execution was going on, a young girl was taken in the woods near Shreveport, Louisiana, by three young men. She was just 13 years old. She was raped. And then they cut her throat and left her to die in the woods. And then the story came out. She was Virginia Smith, a young black girl, and the three white boys who killed her not only didn't get the death sentence, they got reduced sentences because their daddies knew the DA. Equal justice for all is emblazoned on the courts of our, the portico of the Supreme Court building. And there is no equal justice for all. And see, when we started this, when, we, when the Supreme Court put the death penalty back in 76, we'd had a huge crime wave. Crime had been increasing. And it's that instinct 
We're going to settle. We're going to fight fire with fire. They kill. We're going to start killing the worst of them, and that's going to help deter crime. But notice what the solution is. It's a violent solution. It's what we instinctively do in this country. We need to become more reflective and look at the social fabric. We need to see what causes the crime. What's the breeding place of crime? Look at New York. George Pataki, good Catholic George Pataki, runs for governor of New York nine years ago and says, we need the death penalty back in New York. And the first thing he did with the New York Assembly, brought the death penalty back. Nine years later and $150 million later, there were four people selected for death in New York and nine possible death penalty cases. And so the state Supreme Court overturned the statute because it was unconstitutional, which gave New Yorkers a chance to really look at the death penalty. And nine out of every 10 New Yorkers who testified said, we could take that $150 million and we could use it on at-risk kids. We could use it to start building drug clinics to help people with addictions. Why put it into death? And four people, nine years, $150 million? Is this criminal justice or is this political rhetoric? And I learned a long time ago when I first started getting involved with this, this great lawyer, Millard Farmer from Georgia. He said, Sister Helen, yeah, this Georgia accent. Sister Ellen, you got to understand, he says, death penalty is 99% about politics and 1% about criminal justice. And indeed it is. But we have to see through it. So I found myself beginning to go to the murder victims' families and seeing what real help was needed. And now I have met some of the most incredible human beings. My book, The Death of Innocence, is dedicated to murder victims' families for human rights. Bud Welch, daughter Julie, killed in the Oklahoma City bombing. He himself will tell you for the whole first two and a half months, every morning when his feet hit the floor, get McVeigh. All he could think was get McVeigh. Who wouldn't go through that? Who wouldn't think like that? But then he said, I began to notice I'm smoking five and a half packs of cigarettes a day. I'm drinking to get up in the morning. I'm drinking to go to sleep at night. And his moment of epiphany came while he was in his car one day, he had the radio on, and remembered being in the car with Julie. Julie was in the Murrah building that morning because she knew three languages and she was helping translate Spanish to English, whatever people needed to get their social security straight. And the word came to him in his Texaco station, Bud, there's been a terrible explosion. Doesn't Julie work in the Murrah building? Everybody in the whole city heard the explosion. He rushes down. There's a tree, if you ever go to Oklahoma City, they have the memorial. There's a tree, they called it the survivor's tree. It's where the victims would stand to see as they brought out the bodies. And he's there among the people waiting to see if Julie's body's going to be brought out. And his moment of epiphany, he's in the car. He turns the knob of the car, remembers the radio being on, remembers the news that was talking about another execution in Texas. And she had turned to him and said, Dad, that's about nothing but vengeance. And he remembers what she said. And he knows to honor her, he could not ask for the death of the man who killed her, nor would she ask for the death of the man who killed her. And Bud Welch is among so many he said, by the time Timothy McVeigh was executed, most of the victims' families had figured out that if they got to watch Timothy McVeigh die, or if they heard that he was sentenced to life imprisonment, what they had to deal with, their spiritual task was to deal with the empty chair. That they had lost a loved one, and the death was final, and they were never going to get him back. And murder victims' families for human rights are beginning to speak up more loudly that victims' families are re-victimized, that when DAs go for the death penalty and families don't want the death penalty, very often they do not allow them to testify. They only allow victims' families to state their wishes when it fits with their agenda. I end up with Patrick Sonier when he's executed. I end up accompanying him. I end up telling him to look at my face. Here was a man who had been on a spiritual journey. 
It's very questionable, and I raise the question in the book. Eddie, the one who got a life sentence, I believe is the one who really killed those two kids that night. And he was in an emotional upset state, and he had a gun in his hands, and bang, 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 bang. When he told me about it, I could see in his eyes that he did not comprehend even what he had done. He's going to pay for it the rest of his life. He's never going to walk out of prison. But here's Pat being executed, his brother. There's all kinds of stories and sub-stories and dramas in this when human beings say, we are going to decide who among us lives and dies. And then to be with him, when I came out of the execution chamber, he had looked into my eyes. And I walked out, I'd never in my life watched a human being be put to death in this protocol, relentless, polite, quiet protocol of strapping a human being in a chair and killing him. And he had looked at my face and I carried his face. As I carry within me the five other faces, the six faces of people I've accompanied to execution. This is not to make heroes of them. They are not heroes but they were human beings. And that's what I said to the Pope. I said, Your Holiness, when you're walking with somebody who's about to be executed, everything gets very distilled. Are you for life or death? Are you for vengeance or compassion? Are you for love or hate? All very distilled. The gospel of Jesus, very distilled. And when I walked out of that execution chamber that night, April 5th, 1984, I didn't have a clue about what I was going to do. Well, I knew uh, the first thing I did was just throw up because I'd never seen anything like this. It's the middle of the night. Execution had happened at midnight. The sisters are there. They put a coat around me. It was so cold. And then I remember thinking, it's the middle of the night. The polls are showing everybody thinks the death penalty is a great idea. I'm a witness. I got drawn in. I got to tell the story. I didn't know I was going to write a book. You know, I just knew I had to begin sharing with people. And so I'd go to the sociology classes at Loyola University, Dennis Calum. He'd have me as the guest speaker to his captive class, where I began to learn how to take people through the journey. Because in the beginning, I'm talking about human rights, talking about torture, why people should be executed. And the kids are coming back like, what about the victims? You never talk about the victims. And I'm going, they're right, they're right. I got to take people over on both sides. Those of us who are Christian, great image is the cross. It stretches us across. And we live in a culture that says you got to be on one side or the other. If you don't want to have the person executed, okay, you little bleeding heart level, join Amnesty International. But you can't be for the victims as well. And murder victims, families for human rights show us that that's not true. And I learned too that the deepest spiritual values are that both of these human beings have dignity. And human rights are deeper than what governments give to people for good behavior or take away for bad behavior. Human rights that one should not receive degrading punishment or torture. The death penalty, I make the argument in the second book, is torture. We have signed on to the UN Convention Against Torture, which is defined as an extreme mental or physical assault on someone rendered defenseless. And take a human being and put him in a cage for 20 years and let him watch, as Joseph O'Dell did, the second person in the Death of Innocence, watched as 21 men were led to their death before him brought down close to the execution chamber and watched as two, two people, one his good friend, were showered, the execution uh, white jumpsuit put on them, given a shot of Valium, and he watched them being taken through the door and executed in the chamber next to him, and he was next. Mental anguish. And when the torture memos came out around Abu Ghraib, and you were, all the things were appearing in the paper, what was allowable torture to get detainees, suspected terrorists, to give us information. You could tie people up in excruciating positions for 72 hours. You could deprive them of medication or food or water. But even the CIA drew a line of what you could not do, and that is you could not threaten someone with immediate death and then not carry it out for our Supreme Court to recognize that this is cruelty. What will it take for us, the people, to realize that we are practicing torture? 
And it's not to make heroes of people who've done these crimes. We're outraged at the crimes they've done. But look what's happening to us as a people. And when this happens in our state and everybody's in their homes and everybody's separated from it, that's why I had to tell the story. And so I stood there in the dark Louisiana night, having thrown up and realizing that's my job. I'm a witness. I thought of the first epistle of John that said, what we have seen with our eyes and touched with our hands and heard with our ears, this is the gospel we proclaim to you. And so I began, and believe me, there were little bitty audiences. St. Christopher's nursing home in New Orleans, man, that stands out in my mind. An announcement after lunch, who wants to hear the death penalty? None. <laughs> Three people. We go in a room, and I'm not kidding you, after 15 minutes, two of them are gone. I mean, gone. <laughs> One lady was listening. And then, when we are deeply committed, providence works for us, resources make their way to us. I got an offer to write a book, got a contract with Random House, wrote the book. And students, the gifts we receive in our education sit inside us like seeds. You do not know what you are learning and writing now, or whatever, where you may be called to articulate. I was an English major. I had learned to write. I wrote Dead Man Walking. And then the movie happened, and then, and so the word spread. I get on airplanes, and I come to talk to you because I feel like I owe it to our American people. We are not worthy of the death penalty, and we do not need it. And in Illinois, you were one of the first states to hold up before the nation a very flawed system. And that's what I show in this book. Because if you don't have a way of getting truth out at a trial, when juries, even though they do their best, sentence people to death, and they haven't gotten all the facts, or the facts have been skewed or twisted, then we are. It is inevitable that along with the guilty, we are also going to be executing the innocent. I say it's time for a new day. And you do need to know that in your state, as in most states, peop there are life without parole sentences or life sentences, long life sentences for anyone who would have been eligible for the death penalty. So the safety factor, and this is what Pope John Paul also emphasized, we, we don't need to kill people to defend ourselves as a society. And you need to know prisons, there are prisons within prisons. They say, well, what about these sociopaths? They're going to kill guards or other people. The first job of any prison is classification of prisoners. And sociopaths are put in a special lockdown part of the prison so they can't hurt other people or the guards. We can defend ourselves without imitating the violence. And I want to ask you to think about it. And don't think, well, the death penalty, that's like a peripheral moral issue, and I'm only here because my professor told me I had to come tonight anyway. And when will this nun finish? It's not a peripheral moral issue about what we're going to do with some few terrible people who do terrible crimes. It hits the very moral fabric of our society, and every one of our wounds is in it. It's racist. It's predominantly uh, paid for by the poor who pay the price or are asked to be executed, and they get poor defense. And it kind of solidifies that we use violence to solve our social problems. I got some invitations for you, and then we'll have time for questions and conversation. Um, the books, I want to just say to the students, those of you that are here tonight and want to get the book, if you don't have the money with you, we'll give you that. We've been, I've been doing this little trust system as I go across the country. And uh, so you just put your name, your social security number, your waist measurement, your telephone number, <laughs> and your mama's maiden name, and we'll be fine. No, I want you to have the book, and we'll stay and sign books as long as it takes. The Illinois Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty, steadfast souls that have been working in this state. Jennifer Bishop, would you stand up in the back of the room? That's Jennifer. She's going to be near me. And I urge you to join the Illinois Coalition to abolish the death penalty because we have work to do. And the work we have to do is education. 
The books you go to get, some of the books are $100. They're signed by Susan Sarandon and Tim Robbins and me. That's to help us raise money for our moratorium campaign. We needed to move our office. And so if anybody can make a little contribution toward that, uh, we'd appreciate that too. Uh, I think I'm done.